<laughs> no, you wrong. Meet Jochen Brox. He's a biogeochemist and he's my colleague here at ANU. And he made his name in 1999 by discovering eukaryotic biomarkers in 2.7 billion year old sediments. And so he said, ah, that's the oldest eukaryotes ever. But then he found out about 10 years later that he had made a mistake and that it was some type of contamination from the fluids they pumped into these, into these uh, drill holes. And Jochen has also been called upon to write a lovely chapter in one of the most authoritative books, The Treatise on Geochemistry. And he wrote, Sedimentary Hydrocarbons, Biomarkers for Early Life. He knows all about biomarkers in early life. And I sat down and talked with Jochen many times here at the Australian National University, and we talked about all kinds of things. Particularly, are we alone? So, Jochen, are we alone? In the universe? Well, it really depends on who you mean we are. You know, sometimes you can feel alone with humans. Um, wait, wait, wait. When, when I ask you the question, are we alone, what do you understand by the word we? Well, I think most people will think it's humans we're talking about. Are humans alone? Do we expect human-like people, things yeah. elsewhere? I would say no. Why? It's a gut feeling. I don't know. A gut feeling? It's You're a, gut a scientist, feeling. Mark. Yeah, I'm a scientist, but I think the statistics are so poor, the noise is so large, we cannot know. We cannot answer that question. Okay. But are we alone if you mean all our common ancestors on Earth, from the first microbes that split and went to bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes? Um, so if we expect all of, the, if we say we is all of these creatures, and we look for something that's somewhat similar to all of those creatures, then we're not alone. Okay, so you think if we, if the we is humans, we are probably alone. If the we is life, then uh, we're we're not alone. That's correct. Okay, so so what do you mean by life? Do you have a? You're a biologist. You're a geobiologist, right? Yes. So you have an yes. do you have oh, an yes. idea of what life is? Well, the simplest definition is that everything that evolved on Earth from the last common ancestor towards everything that lives today is life. That is the obvious and easiest definition of it. But it would exclude everything that evolved elsewhere. Was the common ancestor alive? Of, yes, the common ancestor was alive. Now, your name is Jochen, right? I'm, I, I, you pushed me out of the picture. So <laughs> I'm, I'm Jochen, I'm not alone here. <laughs> okay. And uh, are we alone in the universe? Depends really, Charlie, on who is we. Oh. You know, if it's humans, sometimes you can feel alone with other humans. Okay, so you and me, Jochen, are we alone? Right here in the gardens, we are not. We're disturbed filming all the time. There's people walking past all the time. Okay. There's people up there making so noise. We're definitely not allowed. There are other human beings on Earth, then, right? But, but anyway, so there are two, <laughs> usually two things. We humans or we the life forms. And you, what do you think of those two, answers to those two questions? So if you ask me if there is life on other planets anywhere in the universe that is similar to the life on Earth, for example, microbes, bacteria, then I would say, yes, there's other life elsewhere. But if you ask me if there's human-like life, something that actually looks like us and thinks like us, it becomes less likely. But, but bacteria are kind of uh, complicated things. Most people think they're very, very simple, but you know that they're very, back, they're very complicated. So why do you put the, most, the simplest things on Earth in the, in the yeah. category of being simple, yeah. so simple that we should expect them elsewhere? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I probably was thinking just about the morphology. If we look through a microscope and we see an archaeon or a bacterium, we probably can expect something that looks sufficiently rather similar elsewhere. It can move, it can metabolize, it fulfills what we would probably define as life. But if we look at the details of its biochemistry, of it, the way it um, transits information from one generation to the other, if it makes generations, it probably is different. Okay, all right, so... But, okay. Uh, let me, uh, Depends on the definition of life. It have, if it has a metabolism, it contains information about creating itself and recreating itself, and it evolves. Then I'm pretty sure these things exist elsewhere. Now, some people think that we would be alone even if we find microbes on Mars. They, they say, I, I don't care if we find microbes on Mars. I'll still be alone. I can't talk to them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's the difference between the question, are we alone or do we feel alone? Mm. Do we, as Earthlings, do we feel alone? even if we find microbial life elsewhere. I would think we would still feel somewhat alone, unless you're a scientist who would get very excited about it. 
and think, wow, there's other microbes like us. So you're dividing we into humans and life, and you're dividing alone into a subjective feeling versus an objective feeling. Well, so alone, alone, you can define as a feeling which is a human feeling, or at least a mammal feeling, or a vertebrate feeling that other life forms on Earth probably don't have. Hmm, but Jock and Brock, if, if, I, if I define something specifically enough, like Jock and Brock's, then Jock and Brock's is alone in, on Earth. There's probably no other Jock and Brock's. Yep. And there's no other Jock and Brock's probably in the solar system or even the entire universe. Okay, so you are alone yeah. then. Well, that's a question of being alone rather than feeling alone. A very different question. You can feel alone with anything and anyone, anywhere, on <laughs> Earth next to you, that's for sure. Um, Jock and Brock's, well, now we talk about, um, you know, Math mathematical bins and packages. Yes, the bin of Jochen Brox and the bin of Charlie Lion Weaver is one everywhere in the universe. Well, this is an important issue because it, it really determines how big you're, you're, you're asking the question. There's a subset, and are you the only member of that set, or is, are there other members? That's what you're saying. So if you make the set, subset really well defined, it's very specific, then you're alone. It but if you make it more general, then less chance that you'll it be will alone. Be, it will be quirky. That means the broader you define life and the broader we define we, mm. the higher the chance are that we find it elsewhere. Okay, is this question, are we alone, an important question? It is not an important question. It's Why? much more, I think, it is an interesting question. Oh, it's well, a, you know, you a non-important, interesting question. <laughs> yes, no, we, well, um, you know, on, on Earth as humans, and particularly if you're a politician that gives money to a funding, agent, funding agency, giving money for scientists, important is usually it can cure cancer and can create more humans and can make money for someone. These are seen as wait, important wait, 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 creating more humans is important? Oh, unfortunately. You got seven billion people. You know, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. But, but everyone who wants to make money and has assets, more humans mean even more power and even more money. And more and pollution seen, and more uh, yes, threats yes. and more war. Yes, more so hunger. Is, so for one, some people it is seen as important to make more money. For some people it's seen to, to save the planet. Right, These are important questions. Are we alone is not a question falls into that category. Well, because I'm, it wait, doesn't I'm not, you're not a politician, you're a scientist. I'm asking you as That's a scientist, right. is are we alone yes. an important That's scientific why, question? No, it's not an important scientific question. It's an interesting question, which is much more important. <laughs> wait, 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 you can't say it's more important than say it's less important. It's an interesting question that makes it no, important. No, being interesting is more important for a scientist than being important. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll leave that to the Zen audience. All right, now, when you have a feeling, now you've studied evolution of life, and there's lots of life around us here. Um, when you study evolution, understand how things evolved and how you got to be here, does that make you a better person? No. <laughs> it doesn't change your life at all? It doesn't, you get to see something like that and say, no, of ah, course, I yes, know yes. its ancestors. Um, if, you, if you define better as being a person who appreciates our life, tries to, to preserve it, look after it, yeah, then better, yes. Knowing how life evolved on Earth, the improbability of all of it, the fragility of all of it, if you know about mass extinctions, um, makes you appreciate life a lot more. It makes you appreciate life, and so you think appreciation is important. Here, come a little closer, come a little closer, come step. So you think, it's important you, you, to appreciate? No, you're not in the middle. You think it's important to appreciate then? Is that the idea? It's if you consider it important that life of a certain type stays on this planet for the next thousands of years, and then these questions are very important. It's appreciating. I'll you know, just thinking, thinking about the five major mass extinctions that the planet went through. Um, you can extend it to six or seven if you include the Great Oxidation event, you include the Pre-Cambrian -Cambrian boundary. Um, but in the Anthropocene or the Plasticene, <laughs> the um, you are plastic not. rubbish scene, <coughs> the plastic will be one layer in the sedimentary record, <laughs> so it will be recognized as a, the plasticine layer of humanity. Uh -huh. um, you know, we're definitely in the next mass extinction. So we and have the privilege of living that, in the plasticine. That, yeah. Charlie, is a very important question. It's not only interesting, it's an important question. Whether we're in another mass extinction, what we can do to get out of it. Well, you know, to figure out who you are is, seems to be an important feature of staying alive. I think. I don't think so. You don't think so? N no. You don't probably, know who you are? No, no, oh, I think. Oh, because these we, plants don't know who they yeah. are and they're staying alive, right? Yes. Uh, you know, when we are gone, bacteria are still there and they're not very close to figuring out who they are. But wait a minute, you just said <laughs> the question, <laughs> are we alone, is, is not important, but it's interesting, so it's more important than important questions. Is that what you said? Yes, and the definition of uh, what's important to funding agency and politicians funding science. Uh -huh. You know, if scientists would fund other scientists exclusively, we would work on interesting questions. <laughs> All right, now, Jochen, have you ever seen a UFO? I, in fact, have seen a UFO. Oh, tell us about it. Um, 
I had a new girlfriend that was in Germany and uh, it was a romantic, warm midsummer's night and we are oh, walking romantic. up the local, yes, the local, there was this local 10th century castle ruin and we are climbing it up and we are sitting on this wall and we are looking at the stars and suddenly this bright light object, um, I would guess a few hundred meters above us, was moving slowly towards us. First I thought, oh, it's a satellite. Um, but no, no, that's, it looks much, cl I could see it was a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think it made a little bit of a noise, but I can't be quite sure, like a flame, bursting flame or something like this. And it moved slowly across the sky and I thought, oh, this is a hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a weather balloon or more likely simply a gas balloon, a fire gas balloon with, yeah. the, with, a, with a basket and humans in it. Yes, it? And, uh, but then above us it stopped and then it changed the 45 degree angle its direction and moved the other way and then it disappeared. A balloon can't do that. Unless the wind uh, changes. But not it would no it, it was a wind still by the way. Well, and, and not necessarily up, we, uh, up a couple so hundred what, meters. What thing? Maybe maybe there's something like a balloon that has a little propeller and so it can oh. actually move in a certain direction. <laughs> um, drones back then. What, didn't what time exist. of day is this? Uh, at night, midnight. And so this was an unidentified flying object. Do you think it was piloted? Uh, unidentified in the sense of I definitely didn't identify it to this day. Do you think it was uh, piloted by alien civilization? There were aliens in it for sure. Okay, very good. Not <laughs> human-like though. So what do you know about aliens? What I know about aliens. Yes, what do you know about aliens? Um, my favorite aliens are those described by Stanislav Lem. Uh -huh. Usually they're funny, they're clown esque. Uh -huh. um, they like are, clowny aliens, funny yes, aliens. Yes, they are, they are human mirrors. They, they, they often reflect our fears and wishes and anxieties. Well, now you're speaking as an artist. I didn't ask you what you wanted. Did I ask you? I asked you what aliens do you know about. I'm, the next question is going to be what aliens do you want to find? And you're asking this question, what do you want to find? Because I'm asking a more serious question. What do you know about aliens? Oh, okay. So it's a serious question, a scientific question, what yeah. I know about aliens. Yes. Um, nothing, Charlie. Well, do you know that they're made out of atoms? I'm not even sure about that. I, I think if you make a really broad <laughs> definition of, do aliens even have to be alive, Charlie? I don't know. You don't. You, you're, you don't tell me yes. what life. So, is, if an alien is actually a, a, an intelligent robot, is that life? Well, well the civilization that created a robot might go and extinct, and the robots replicate themselves. Yes, Are it. they alive? Sure. Maybe we would say they're not alive because we probably would have a hard time defining an artificially intelligent robot on Earth as alive. We probably would say it's not alive because if we declared alive, he would have to, you know, give it rights, maybe even human rights, and I so we wouldn't it, do that. I think if it killed all the humans, then it would be alive because it could define life itself. Yeah, so I think our best chance right now to find alien life, of course, is Mars. And I have some hope for a return probe to Enceladus, mm. the Saturn moon, because there is, out of the tiger stripes, there is this geysers yes, of yes, ice yes, yes, yes. that have, has organic matter on it. And um, if in the deep ocean beneath the ice of Enceladus uh, is life, I'm pretty sure we'll find traces of it in returned ice from Enceladus. You know, that's our best chance, I guess. You know that if we find life on Mars, that evolved independently, yep. that would be the worst news that humans have ever had. Bad news in the, the sense of that we solved this one of the most no. amazing, most important questions that humans could possibly have, and then there's nothing more interesting to move on to? No, it's bad because of the Fermi paradox. We see if life is easy to get started, then the only way you can explain the Fermi paradox is by self-destruction and being killed later on. See, it's, it's a bottom. I don't understand that. Okay, so we say, we look around and we don't see any alien civilizations, right? We yes. Say, okay, why is that? Now, one thing could be, well, maybe life is hard to get started. Maybe life is hard to get started. And yep. that, that is, and or, but if we find alien life on Mars, we say, yes. well, that's not the case. Or maybe it is that w once a civilization okay. gets technological, right. they all kill right. themselves. Okay, and but there's a huge difference between, as you many times said, Charlie, uh, between the origin of something lifelike that leads towards microbes or uh, pure chemical life without encapsulation in the cell, which we might find on Mars, and intelligent life, macroscopic life, multicellular life, li human-like life, the probability becomes less and less likely. So finding life on Mars uh, doesn't mean that all the other Earth-like planets or rocky planets out there have actually civilizations that are sending signatures and UFOs. No, the point is that since we don't have them, uh, 
any... <laughs> no, so life on Mars, if we, you know, we have statistics of two, and we could say, well, you know, if there's independent evolution of life on Mars and on Earth, which would be, by the way, extremely difficult to, to prove. If it's organic, no. it could still have the same origin, being exchanging... No, no, I think, I think you're missing the point. The point, is the, that point. We, the point is that the universe is big, lots of planets, you have lots of... T if you're an advanced civilization, you have lots of time to colonize the entire galaxy, yep. right? But that's not the case. Yep. All right. So, what is it that keeps life from doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, one explanation is maybe life is hard to originate. But if we find life on Mars, separate origination, yep. then that's not the bottleneck. Then right. the bottleneck, instead of being behind us, yep. is in front of us. In which well, case we will so destroy I, ourselves in every, like every other civilization. I think, with a, I, I think there's two, two problems with this reasoning. The first one is, even if we find life with a different chemistry on Mars that looks very different from Earth, it's still not a proof it's actually an independent origination. Mm -hmm. It could be in the prebiotic chemistry state it was exchanged between mm -hmm. these two planets. It's the first thing. Extremely hard to prove unless on Mars we find silicon-based life for it. The big difference is the following, Charlie. Even, even if there was clearly improvable an independent, and you hate the word independent, I know that, an independent <laughs> origin of life on Mars, mm. um, that, ma that life, if that life, life is microscopic, and we show it's a very different chemistry from Earth. It evolved in a completely different way, different set, maybe not even has amino acids, a different type of information mm. transmission to the next generation, not based mm. on DNA, or something completely mm. different. Mm. So we say, oh, this is really rather independent, or mm -hmm. maybe mm. entirely independent. And that's something, based on a sample of two, we find two sets of life. Life must have evolved on all rocky planets that have the Goldilocks. Um, that doesn't mean that this life evolves into a large, complex, multicellular life that has human-like intelligence, okay. builds civilizations, and goes out there. Okay. And even if that was true, uh, me, maybe we are at the front tail end of the probability distribution. Maybe on Earth, intelligent civilizations happened in the spectrum where it can happen extremely quickly. Maybe we're really, really ahead, and everywhere else where it might still happen is a billion so years So that's behind. the we are first argument. Well, amongst the top 5%, maybe. <laughs> Humans like to think that. Well, if we were not the first... Or then maybe they're even a bit more smarter and think <laughs> about it's very stupid to advertise that you're here. Okay. Um, now, Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology will be, in, will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a guy named Carl Schroeder who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently <laughs> advanced technology, civilization, will be, indi will be indistinguishable from nature. Oh, b both very interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, indistinguishable from magic, no. We, we humans get used to things that seem to be or are magic extremely quickly. I mean, the microwave oven, come on. You don't see anything there, it becomes hot. That's magic. You get, you know, kids that, I still find microwaves, each time I use a microwave oven or a mobile phone, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, these things are magic, they can't possibly work really. <laughs> the microwave oven can't work, but I put my noodles mm -hmm. in there and I become hot and I find it magic each time. Yes. The kid that grew up with mobile phones and grew yes, up yes, with yes, a yes. microwave oven, mm -hmm. that's not magic at all, that's life. That's, I see it, I do it every day. I mean, gravity is more magic. No one is marveling about that. Mm -hmm. okay. Or existence. You know, right? so, no, so the magic <laughs> argument will not work. We'll get used to it very quickly. Okay, now, have you seen the movie <laughs> Contact? Uh, no. No, okay. No. Anyway, it's based on a book called Contact by Carl Sagan. And in this movie, the characters get asked, are we alone? And the standard mm -hmm. response is, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. I like that answer. It's very nice. It's a very human answer. <laughs> let's colonize everything. And let's bulldoze it, remove it. It's just wasted space. We want human-like intelligence everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> we do it with our planet, right? It's all wasted space. We move this stupid forest here. We can make some money by putting... Okay, no, but you're being cynical and skeptical here. No, no cynical. That's so pretty realistic, isn't it? It, it might be. But it's what, a very, what, very human response, I have to well, say. Well, is it your response? <laughs> Would you agree with it? Would you, what do you think? Do you think if there aren't, if the universe is not populated with billions and billions of Jochen Brocks, do you think it's a waste there of space? There might be a gray movement rather than a green movement that says we should stop colonizing and greening all the other planets. We should preserve them as they are. Preserve them as gray, abiotic. Yes, yes, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, uh, putting mold on a, on a good cheese that starts molding, you know, bad cheese like aspergillus. So you don't put think... Just, wait, you know, wait, wait, wait. You green <laughs> stuff on Mars and green it, and the planet is destroyed, its beauty is gone, it's all just covered in this green mold. So you think that uh, we should not become a multi-planet species? Um, well, it's a difficult question. I would feel very tempted to, to visit other planets and green them. It's a very human <laughs> thing to do. All right. Now, uh, if I gave you $100 billion, 
with the caveat, you have to yeah. spend this money to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? I would send a probe to Enceladus and collect water from the tiger-striped gaseous and bring the samples back to Earth. And I hope we'll find uh, molecular evidence and maybe even morphological evidence of life on Enceladus. So what would you do with the other 95% of the money I gave you then? That's 100 only... billion, I think it will cost that much. No, no, 100 no? No, then no, I would, no? Then I would go, rather than looking for life on other planets, I would go to a moon, make a big quarry, look for four billion year old, well-preserved asteroids that landed, were ejected from Earth, landed on the moon, because it would be beautifully well preserved and we could look for but prebiotic chemistry, but origin of life the, on Earth. Uh, then you're investigating yeah. the origin of life yes, on Earth. Yes, I would investigate how the origin of... How does that answer the question, are we alone? Um, it will tell us more about how the origin of life came about. We learn maybe something about prebiotic chemistry, what were the first chemicals that were needed to create, create the first life. And that might inform us quite a lot better about how and why it could happen elsewhere. Where? What are the public's or the students' biggest misconceptions about this question, are we alone? I don't think that most students that I teach have thought about it at all. So mm -hmm. there's probably no misconceptions. No misconceptions? No, no, no well thought. No, their biggest misconceptions, misconceptions is they haven't thought about it. That's a, yes. <laughs> you said That's it's, a a, so it's difficult to say if you haven't thought about something at all, whether you have a misconception. <laughs> Really? So you don't talk about this at all in your classes about ge geobiology? The origin of life? No, we actually don't discuss the origin of life. Oh. Wow. I find Why not? In the what, moment, what, what, quite what? little. We, we discuss um, the, not the origin of life on Earth, but the earliest evidence for life on Earth and when it might have happened. Mm -hmm. But we don't discuss the... Well, one, one reason is that my students do not have chemical prerequisites. And discussing the origin of life is really only satisfying if you discuss the chemistry quite deeply. What do, okay. you, what do you need? What chemistries are needed? Uh, All right, um, well, Self-replicating chemical cycles and so on. Well, forget about your students then. Let's talk about the public. <laughs> let's talk yeah. about the public. What yeah. do you think the public's biggest misconceptions are about the question, are we alone? I do not know what the perception is, but I can only imagine you don't it's talk extremely, to people? Not, not well, who is the general public, right? <laughs> you know, scientists know as little about life elsewhere than the general public, so what is a misconception? Well, for example, if you think Superman came, f evolved on another planet and came and had sex with Lois Lane, that seems to be a big misconception okay, that so scientists the, yes. could undo. So if there's really stupid misconceptions, I would think uh, we're not alone again. I think it's the, it's the, I, I don't feel alone with parrots, by the way. Oh, good, good. Bird parrots, not uh -huh. human parrots. Yeah, right, right. right. I, um, then the most likely misconception is that people may expect aliens that look humanoids. Particularly from old science fiction movies, it's the easiest thing to, to take a human actor and put some alien makeup around it and play. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to play this if the eyes are somewhere at the feet. It's hard to film as well. So on, on, in science fiction, they're always human-like. Yeah. And I th you know, with modern, modern computer technology, aliens start looking a little bit more alien. I think that I like that. So you have any... Uh any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists and dedicating their lives to trying to answer you this question, what? are I, you alone? I actually think watching, watching Star Trek and watching all those humanoid aliens is probably actually a pretty good way to get excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, wait a minute, yeah. first you say the biggest misconceptions are in the movies, then you're saying, hey, I advise yes, you to watch yes, the movies. But fixing your misconceptions for intelligent people is a, is a big drive to study something. Fixing misconceptions, so you want to give yes, the misconceptions yes. so, so the, you can undo the, them. If you, you know, if you have this vague feeling about alien life, they're all, you know, they are big brained and have have this ellipsoid eyes and so on. And it's just completely insane why we think it should look like that. Um, if you start thinking a little bit deeper about it, you very quickly move away from anything like that, and you start thinking about, well, like you, a twister. It, it's well, well, wait, wait, wait. But there are some scientists, like Simon Conway Morris, who thinks that oh, we should expect humanoid aliens elsewhere. Yeah, and you said it's yes, completely yes, insane. He also in the Bible, <laughs> right? Christ's sake. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So religion is not part of your worldview. Here. It's just uh, as, as deluded as believing in human-like aliens. Okay. All right. And uh, well, by, the, by the way, by the believing in a god uh, and, and, and similar things that is, it is believing in a human-like alien, is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, yeah. I've, I've sometimes accused SETI researchers, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. They have radio telescopes and they're yeah. looking for advanced civilizations. And I'm, I've sometimes accused them of looking for God because people <laughs> say, oh, I'm looking for some 
Now, I'm not looking for God. I'm looking for a, a ubiquitous, uh, all-knowing that can answer all my physics questions. Yes, I can, I can see this Gary Larson jokes of this bearded, gray-haired <laughs> old man uh, you know, building a radio telescope <laughs> and sending these messages to SETI.